As a prolific country music legend once said, if you tell my heart, my ache could break your heart, he might blow up and kill this man. Now, a little known fact is that Billy Ray was suffering an acute attack of myocarditis at the time. Yeah, mind blown, right? By the way, the whole he might blow up and kill this man part, that's a direct reference to the risk of progressing to dilated cardiomyopathy. You know, when the heart's all blown up. At that point, you're well on your way to heart failure and cardiogenic shock. But this kind of heartbreak is a pretty common occurrence for the patrons of the Flaming Heart Bar. And you know what? That sign in the back perfectly depicts everything we're about to cover. Myocarditis is a heterogeneous group of disorders that cause inflammatory damage to the myocardium. In other words, something, whether it's a virus or toxin or drug hypersensitivity reaction, is causing immune cells to enter the myocardium and set off a chain reaction of inflammation. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, yeah, they all show up. In the United States, the most common cause of myocarditis, by far, is some kind of acute viral infection. And the classic example involves Coxsackie virus B. Who can forget that cute little Coxsackie cockatoo from Sketchy Micro? Hmm. Classic. Remember how it's always paired with that dilated sack of birdseed? Before it reaches the stage of overt dilated cardiomyopathy, however, a few processes have to occur first. As she grabs onto that virus-evoking handle for the tap, I want you to imagine immediate damage initiated by the virus itself. This is before the cellular immune response before your body even notices you have an infection. So myocytes are already being destroyed by direct viral toxicity, perforin-mediated cell lysis, and cytokine expression. And then your body knows something is up. Send in the immune cells. In this scene, the bar counter is supposed to evoke an image of the myocardium. And those little invading blue seeds meant for the Coxsackie cockatoo up there depict the characteristic little blue nuclei of the cellular infiltrate seen on histology. Now, this whole time, the damage continues. T cells and NK cells remove virus infected cells, macrophages clean up cellular debris, the whole shebang. This is the itis of myocarditis. And it's kind of like your own body is damaging the myocardium at this point. An immune response is directed against virally infected cells, destroying them. This initial immune phase is also helpful for containing further spread of the virus, however. And most of the time, the virus is effectively cleared, and the patient only experiences a brief, self-limiting myocarditis. In some patients, though, myocarditis persists. This is because the viral damage to myocytes causes the release of cross-reactive self-antigens that confuse T-cells. And before you know it, an adverse autoimmune response is directed against these autoantigens, which includes proteins like cardiac myosin, just think of this jar of IgG evoking toothpicks here, toppled over onto the myocardial bar counter. These autoantibodies cause further inflammation, necrosis, and even fibrosis of heart tissue. Overall, just remember that viral myocarditis involves both direct viral injury to myocytes as well as further inflammation caused by your own body's immune response. And though Coxsackie virus is the classic example, numerous other viruses have been implicated, including adenovirus, HIV, parvovirus, and herpes simplex 6. Now, in the vast majority of cases, the disease remains subclinical, just a brief viral infection quickly cleared by your body. Sometimes, however, the damage caused in the setting of acute viral myocarditis can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. As the inflammation progresses, the myocardium becomes flabby and mottled with pale and hemorrhagic areas. All the chambers become dilated. Just think of this floppy, dilated bag of birdseed. This impairs systolic function, and as we covered earlier at the dilated cardiomyopathy sac race, systolic heart failure ensues. So we've sketched in a recurring floppy, failing heart failure balloon. Expect the typical symptoms of progressive dyspnea with exertion, orthopnea, and peripheral edema. On the test, the question stem will describe some flu-like symptoms the patient had a week before. That means they're trying to hint at some kind of viral infection. And now, the patient is presenting with symptoms of heart failure. It'll be some young dude too. 
not your typical decompensated heart failure patient. Start thinking of acute viral myocarditis. Okay, so most of the time, the virus is cleared, and no heart failure symptoms develop. When we start talking about the causes of overt dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure, however, and the question writers mention something about Central or South America, you should immediately think of Chagas disease. Remember that dilated sac from Shea's gas station? Well, in this scene, it's the brand of the finest IPA on tap. What'll it be? Regular, plus, or supreme unleaded? The causative agent of Chagas disease is not a virus, by the way. This time, it's the protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi that's invading the myocardium. Although uncommon in the northern hemisphere, Chagas disease affects up to half the population in endemic areas of South America. Whoa! In the vast majority of cases, the myocardium is involved, but this usually causes no symptoms or only mild, nonspecific symptoms. In some patients, however, symptomatic myocarditis ensues, as well as dilated cardiomyopathy. In fact, about 5% of patients die during an acute attack. So watch out for symptoms of rapidly progressive heart failure. Other times, the disease progresses more chronically, with signs of heart failure and arrhythmia as many as 10 to 20 years later. Fulminant Chagas disease also presents with megaesophagus and toxic megacolon. Check out our sketchy micro video for more details. Microscopic examination of the myocardium will show the typical dense cellular infiltrate and myofiber destruction just like in viral myocarditis. Sometimes, however, little lens-shaped nests of protozoa can be seen within the myocardial fibers, kind of like this lens-shaped bowl of nuts on the myocardial counter here. Besides Trypanosoma cruzi, other parasitic causes of myocarditis include Toxoplasma gondii and Trichinella. These are much less common, and more relevant clinical info is covered in our sketchy micro course. So we've moved on to non-viral causes of myocarditis, which includes pretty much every infectious agent you can think of. Let's see what else is on tap, shall we? The bacterial-themed handle there should remind you of the numerous bacterial infections that can lead to myocarditis, such as rickettsia and mycoplasma. The most important bacterial cause you need to remember, however, is Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. It's commonly transmitted by the Ixodes tick, so it's sketchy, this bug is embodied by none other than the wanton man himself, Robin of Ixodes. Myocarditis occurs in about 5% of patients with Lyme disease, which usually manifests as some kind of conduction system defect, like heart block. Hence the heart block shield he's often carrying. Myocarditis is usually self-limited, though it often requires insertion of a temporary pacemaker. Hey, even fungi want to get in on this myocarditis party. It's rare, but causative agents include candida, mucor, and aspergillus. For a fungus to invade the myocardium, the patient usually has to be immunocompromised. So we've made sure to include a recurring immunocompromised cane. Next on the menu, toxins. As highlighted by that toxin-evoking handle there. This could mean a drug acting as a toxin and exerting direct damage to the heart, or a bacterial toxin. Think of Carinibacterium diphtheriae, it doesn't directly invade the heart tissue. Instead, it sends out a toxin into the bloodstream, which exerts systemic effects. Whenever you think of diphtheria, think of chips and dip. You remember diphtheria, that disease in kids that causes pseudomembranes in the back of the throat and that classic bull neck from diffuse neck swelling. These reactions are all toxin-mediated. And toxin can reach the heart muscle as well, causing myocarditis. It's usually seen after the patient is already recovering from the respiratory phase of the illness. Watch out for ST wave changes, QT prolongation, and heart block. Drugs can also act as toxins. Think of that doxorubicin boxorubis causing all kinds of free radical damage to the myocardium. In Sketchy Farm, this was symbolized by a stream of oxidizing bubbles. Other toxins that can directly damage myocardial cells, causing myocarditis, include alcohol, carbon monoxide, cocaine, diuretics, and some antibiotics. Drugs can cause myocarditis indirectly as well. By that I mean the drug doesn't have to directly interact with the heart muscle to cause toxic damage. Instead, inflammation is triggered in the myocardium during a hypersensitivity reaction. Sulfa drugs, furosemide, HCTZ, ampicillin, azithromycin, and zidovudine 
all have been shown to cause hypersensitivity myocarditis days to weeks after their initiation. Think of it as having a delayed allergic reaction to the drug, but at the same time, there's an uncontrolled expansion of T-cells that causes all kinds of systemic symptoms. This includes fever and rash, but also things like hepatitis and even myocarditis. In hypersensitivity myocarditis, the typical histological pattern is a perivascular infiltrate with abundant eosinophils, along with the typical lymphocytic interstitial infiltrate. So we've included both blue and pink shot glasses getting filled to convey the plethora of both blue lymphocytes and pink eosinophils you'll see on histology. The last type of myocarditis to cover is that caused by autoimmune disorders. Hence the autoantibody darts over there, targeting that heart. Myocarditis is a common component of systemic lupus erythematosus, for example, occurring in over 10% of patients. It's usually asymptomatic, though it can cause tachycardia, systolic dysfunction, and conduction defects such as heart block. Other autoimmune disorders are associated with myocarditis as well, including Wegener's granulomatosis, giant cell arteritis, and Takayasu arteritis. Now is the time to bring group A strep infection into the equation as well. That's strep pyogenes. And at Sketchy, it's always represented with a crusty and delicious pyogenes pie. Mmm, what is that? Strawberry rhubarb? Rhubarb is a recurring theme for rheumatic fever, by the way. A collection of symptoms that can occur about two to four weeks following a group A strep pharyngitis. We'll get into the details in the next chapter. For now, I just want you to focus on those autoantibodies targeting the heart. Bacteria are not directly invading the myocardium here, and this is not a toxin being released by strep. Strep pyogenes actually tricks the immune system with molecular mimicry. So, the B cells that were initially activated in order to attack the bacteria instead send out antibodies against myocardial cells. In acute rheumatic fever, myocardial biopsy will show interstitial fibrosis with scattered multinucleated giant cells and interstitial granulomas but this will all be covered in the next chapter. Don't worry. Let's finish up with a few important clinical signs that should point you in the direction of myocarditis. The clinical spectrum of myocarditis is broad. For most patients, the disease is asymptomatic, and patients recover without sequelae. Expect to see at least something like fever, dyspnea, and fatigue on the test. Myocarditis can also mimic an MI, so watch out. There can be chest pain and fatigue. And because cardiac myocytes are being damaged, creatine kinase and troponins are being released into the serum as well. And at Sketchy, that means a bucket full of creatine kinase crispy chicken with a troponin T-bone steak on the side. Myocarditis may even present with sudden cardiac death. Remember, a damaged heart means a damaged conduction pathway. This can set off arrhythmias. And ventricular arrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, can be fatal. Just think of this cell phone that's vibrating, fibrillating even. Yeah, he's not picking up anytime soon. It's thought that myocarditis is the underlying cause of 15 to 20% of cardiac death cases in adults under 40. And that's kind of the theme here, young people. Remember that heart failure balloon on the left of the sketch there? Because on the test, they're probably going to focus on the most common cause of myocarditis, and that's viral. It'll be preceded by some flu-like symptoms, and a week later, bam, your patient has symptoms of heart failure. But he's so young. He's like full-on ponytail mullet Billy Ray Cyrus young. What's he doing with heart failure? Start thinking of viral myocarditis causing dilated cardiomyopathy with some serious systolic dysfunction.